I'm uh, tickled really with our next speaker. He's sort of uh, filled in at the last minute for somebody else. Uh, this is uh, Mark Schultz, and uh, he's not the uh, ordinary engineer, as you would say, a uh, licensed California uh, civil structural and geotechnical engineer, and uh, 15 years with the Division of Safety of Dams. Uh, the rest of uh, his bio you can read in your program, so let me introduce uh, Mark Schultz with uh, three registrations I'm impressed, and I'm interested to hear about the uh, current design. Thanks for coming, Mark. Well, hello, and thank you for the opportunity to speak before the distinguished crowd, and especially after a Tom McClintock, a difficult <laughs> act to follow. Uh, I'm Mark Schultz with the Division of Safety of Dams, State of California. Uh, we, at the Division of Safety Dams, our mission is to protect uh, life and property from dam failure. Uh, we try to stay neutral on whether or not we insure or w would build a dam in any place, but we have 1,250 of them to regulate. And uh, that's our job and our mission. I'll talk a little bit about how that might fit into a role and just give you some background information from, say, a perspective of uh, a uh, permitting agency, similar as if you were to go get a building permit for a new house or, or wanted to remodel your home, you think of it that way. We're kind of a one-stop shop for state dam regulatory <laughs> permitting. We uh, also work with federal agencies on federal projects in California. Um, we, although we don't have a regulatory rule in those projects, such as Folsom, we do uh, get very involved in almost every case from uh, just wanting to know what the state opinion is for regard to dam safety on all these projects for example the Folsom project there you go. Folsom project um, is a joint federal two, two federal agencies actually state and of course safe local sponsors it turns out the state of California is actually uh, spending about 35 percent of the cost of that project you don't always hear that much about it but the design is being done at the federal level and the state would like to know that we're spending our money wisely and the dam will meet state dam safety standards. So we can involve indirectly at that point and have, I've been involved in that project for about 14 years in all, all different uh, roles and configurations trying to help move that project forward. So I'm going to talk just a little bit briefly about our agency division of safety at dams uh, and a little bit about our role in history, how we came to be. Then I want to talk a little bit about a regional approach to some large and successful dam projects and kind of give you a sense of what a, a region can do pulling together and complete some big dam projects. And I'll touch just a little bit on some modern dam building techniques that have developed uh, recently since this uh, Auburn Dam project was last uh, heavily scrutinized and, and under design revision. So I'll give you some ideas on some of the changes that have occurred in terms of dam building techniques. Uh, the Division of Safety of Dams, as I mentioned, regulates 1,250 dams in California, where all those dots are. Um, along the coast area, you'll notice that's where most of the people live. And there's also where the uh, great number of the faults are as well. So we're, we're dealing with faults, people, and large bodies of water. So there's quite a risk, and this is why we're probably the largest dam safety organization, uh, definitely in this, of all the states, but uh, one of the larger ones in, in the world, actually. Um, basically, we are, like I mentioned, a permitting authority. We have a regulatory uh, uh, authority to control the uh, design and approval of new dam construction, uh, raises or alterations to dam as well, dams, as well as uh, repair or modifications. So we're, we're in a continuous mode of risk reduction, trying to look for weak links with it. There may be some issues that were overlooked in the past. Uh, a lot of these dams were designed, you know, decades ago. And, Sometimes they're not, they haven't been looked at under modern techniques, so we're always going back, looking back over them. And we're also getting a lot of projects come in the door where people want to raise it or make changes to their dam, their operations and whatnot. And believe it or not, we are still building new dams. A lot of people seem to think that's all over. Well, the great era of building dams is definitely over. And we're in more of a management rule now. But we are still building dams and raising dams. We also inspect and approve uh, the construction during these projects, so we're out there on site. And we are monitoring existing dams. There's a lot of instrumentation that goes in dams to uh, make sure they're doing what they're supposed to do. And we're always also preparing for emergency response should there be a big earthquake or a dam emergency. And those happen as well, of course. Our history and our origin comes from a, a catastrophe, uh, the St. Francis Dam failure. 
1928. The following year, there was um, a lot of legislation and activity re with regards to that failure. What you see right there is a one little remaining monolith in the dam. Uh, it failed on both sides of it, and it was quite catastrophic. It was the largest engineering failure probably in the United States history at that time, but definitely in California, <laughs> because it was strictly an engineered failure. It was on the first filling that it failed, and uh, 450 at least, probably more than that, were, were lost in 1,200 homes, 10 bridges. It scoured a huge uh, swath all the way down to the ocean. And on the right, you'll see some bits, chunks of huge concrete monoliths busted up and carried down the street. I'll give you an illustration of the power of water and the, what we're dealing with with dams. Now, this dam was not regulated. It was built before dams were fully regulated. Somewhere, somewhere at that time, if you had an in-house engineering firm, you were exempt from regulation. The design was changed a couple times during destruction, destruction, <laughs> construction. Uh, without really re-engineering it. They raised it 10 feet and then another 10 feet. They did not always pay attention to some geologic flaws on both sides of the uh, abutments, both canyons, both sides of the canyon, and uh, did not take all the defensive measures that were pretty much standard practice. So they, they basically cut some corners, they weren't regulated, and, that's, and the result uh, is what you see there. So as a result of that, we, state regulation of dams was, was widespread uh, for pretty, there were very few exceptions at that point. And it also started the whole concept of registering civil engineers came out of that disaster. There, there was a thought that no one person should have that much control over a project with such potential for public safety um, risk. So and there were numerous, numerous boards and panels and several other projects were affected at the time. There were, uh, of course, 13 different panels investigated the actual disaster, but it also if affected other dams. The San Gabriel Dam project was changed from a concrete rock uh, to a rock fill. Um, Hoover Dam went through some changes. They actually paused on that for a little while. And also had uh, one of the first legal ramifications for a victim compensation following disasters where the people were compensated due to the uh, failure. Um, a little bit about the process, it's on the title of this, it's not just engineering a safe dam, which is our business, but the process of building and, and going through the uh, design process is something I just want to give you the big picture of here. Basically, it starts with feasibility and planning studies, and there have been tons of those on the Auburn Dam, as you know, and then it's evolved quite a bit, and, and as you move forward, the, where, you let, where it was left off may not be the way you pick up, and if it, if it were to fall under state jurisdiction, we'd probably take a fresh look at all these things and, 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 and go from there. So that there's, there'd be more feasibility studies, more geotechnical exploration, reconsider the site selection, if that's the best place for it or not. The type of dam, you know, that's been changed. It started out as a thin gravity dam, went to, they considered rock fill, they considered, uh, the latest version is a, uh, they call it a, a thick arch or, or, a, or a gravity arch, arched gravity, several ways of saying the same thing basically, but instead of a thin arch, it's curved, yeah, they believe the current design it actually had the same exact footprint, same axis as the original thin arch, they thickened it and made it more of a conventional concrete shape. So even the, all those things would ideally be up for grabs and reconfigure your project and make sure it makes the most sense for you and, and go forward with that. You know, in parallel with that, and, and critically important is the environmental review, of course, and in order to understand that, what the, what's on the table, you need to have that feasibility and design laid out. And then from there, move into the detailed design. And that's really where we really get especially involved, although it's good to have your regulatory agencies involved as early as possible to help guide through this process. But um, at that point, that's where we really buckle down and roll up our sleeves and, and do an independent analysis. So we don't just look at plans and specifications. If you go get a building permit, they check through and make sure you're meeting the building code and make a few changes here and there, and where you go. We actually dig in and do our own numerical analyses and independent studies if we were doing it ourselves and designing the dam. And we don't have to get into as much nitty gritty detail, but we actually take a fresh look at it like that. And that's one of the things that distinguishes the agency and our process from other regulatory agencies, is that we actually do that. A lot of other uh, agencies rely on consultants for that, or they just check the plans or whatever. But that's really where we actually add value as well as doing a better job. We, we think we do a better job, but we also find ways where you can save money, do a better, uh, do, you know, get the same product for a less effort. And, uh, so we can we can add value to a project. Sometimes we, we add more because we're trying to increase safety. That's the more general trend, but it doesn't always go that way. And then your construction on these big projects is almost always phased, you know, with different uh, contracts and different contractors. It's, that's pretty 
pretty standard. And then following the construction, there's a filling plan, operations, and maintenance that I'm going for. So that's kind of the layout of the whole thing. And just have to kind of keep that process in mind as you go. There's, in terms of type of dam, there's a couple of large uh, rock fill earth dam, small earth fill dam, for example, or a couple of concrete dams, an arch dam, and step, to, step downstream face dam on the, on the right gravity dam. Um, and moving on to geologic reviews, which is a really important consideration, or especially early on in the project, you want to try to tie down your seismicity, get your site selection correct, and whatnot. And th this turns out, as we all know, to be quite an issue at, at Auburn Dam. It, uh, it, you know, following that Orville earthquake, it, it focused a lot of attention on the foundation and the potential for faulting and on site and whatnot. And uh, I, don't, I don't want to go over any of that too much in detail or anything, but I, I'd just like to say that there, there's really two components. So one is the actual ground motion, the, the shaking of the dam itself. And that part is, we handle that all over California. There's no avoiding that. And I, and I don't think anybody would dispute that, that we, we can build a dam to handle the, type, the earthquake that we're expecting. We've gotten a lot better about predicting what type of motion would hit it and designing for it. Um, the fault investigations and fault issues were really what triggered a lot of intense uh, uh, scrutiny of this project. And in, um, I will just say, looking back on it, it's not that anybody knew that there was a problem, it's we could not absolutely uh, exclude a problem. It's, it's more what the, the situation is out there. there. There, you need geologic evidence to demonstrate when the fault last moved, how much it moved. And due to the circumstances out there in that particular part of, the, of, of California in general, but in particular that site, there isn't a lot of evidence. And so it's more of a pr trying to prove the negative is what it is. So it's, it's prudent to be cautious and take a conservative approach on these things. And I think that's really what led to a lot of the problems. That there was no definitive answer. There's no measurement you could make and plug it into an equation. And there's your answer. It really comes down to a lot of differences of opinion amongst experts. And the range of answers that came out of that back then and would probably likely come out of it again are, are something that we can't deal with and have in the past. It's just, it's a cost item, it's a design feature item, it's, it's a general, and there, in the end there's some residual risk to society. But in general, that's not the first place we would design a dam like this with those conditions, and uh, it's something that can be done. It just needs to be taken into consideration in the design, and you accept the additional cost and design features that are necessary to do it. But, uh, from a technical perspective, I think it's been stated over and over again that, that it is doable, it's feasible. That's not always the perception that's out there, of course, but that's the reality of it. It's more, uh, it's, it's more uh, understanding and dealing with uncertainty in a response to that. Some of the numerical analyses we use have really evolved quite a bit, actually, since the last, since this dam was looked at previously. Uh, we, we do finite, it's called finite element analyses. Uh, where a very sophisticated computer analysis. So we've been able to sharpen our pencil quite a bit on what the performance issues are to dam, given the seismic loadings or whatever the loadings you're looking at. However, there's always some uncertainty and a lot of judgment that still needs to go into these analyses. So um, given just that our tools are better, it's helped quite a bit, but there's still uh, a lot of engineering judgment that goes into it as well. But um, as I said, we're, we're building dams in a high seismic environment all over California. A couple shots of construction inspection and supervision, just uh, a couple dams that were under construction. As you can see, they're really big projects, and we need to be down there to make sure that they're uh, constructed according to plans and specs, and it's not always the case, and we can do what we have to do to make sure that happens. Now I want to talk just a little bit about a regional approach that you might find interesting. Um, it's something that happened down in San Diego County. They're, they're in a little different situation than Northern California. They're at the end of the pipeline, so to speak. They're at the end of the state water project. They're importing water from Colorado River and whatnot. And, and their problems are a little different. Uh, their supply is managed on a, a very much of an importing basis. Their biggest issue is not having much, as much in, in, uh, in reach and storage, and not just from a supply standard, but from a a reliability standard should there be an emergency uh, outside of their region. If, if, if that state of water project were disrupted for whatever reason, say an earthquake on uh, some canal part near Lancaster, who knows what, or something happened on the Colorado River, their, their supplies are going to dwindle quickly. And they started looking at solutions to that early on. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about their timeline here in a second. But it's a pretty big area. It's, a, it's a 23 member water agencies in the San Diego County. There's 2.5 million customers. Uh, they're talking about maybe half a million acre feet of, of water per year. 
And um, like a, as you can see from there, 70 to 95% of their water is in Borneo. That, that's coming a long ways away. So there's a great possibility and a high risk of uh, service disruption. And they recognized this way back in the 80s and started a long series of plans and whatnot uh, in terms of capital improvement program with many different components to it. Yeah, I'll just run down those real quick. It started in 89 really where they had a distribution plan and they launched this huge capital improvement program. Started out with 10 projects and they enveloped into it a component called the emergency storage project that enveloped into a, or led into a strategic plan in 1995. They started allocating money and budgeting for it in 98. And in 2004, they updated the regional water facilities master plan for the whole region and just and laid out the distribution system where it is and where they wanted to go with it and kind of prioritized their, where they wanted to get their supplies, what they thought was available. And in the end, eventually authorized it all financially through a, a, a business plan in 2004 and, and took off from there. So as you can see, there's 15 years of planning right there to get where they actually started all this work. These are some of the projects as of 2005. Um, this has been updated, but this was, I kind of leveraged this slide from another presentation. So as you can see, there's a variety of them, and these are millions of dollars, so we're talking actual trillion, uh, billions when we get at the, uh, where the comma should be. So there's 907 million for the emergency storage project. That actually evolved into 1.5 billion uh, in an update later. But you can see they had system-wide improvements, <coughs> pipeline projects, um, uh, just pumping and, and, and uh, hydroelectric facilities, not too much of that. And uh, just a variety of smaller projects, a lot of slip lining of their pipes. And I'll talk about a couple of key projects that came out of that in a second. The first one is the Libenheim Reservoir and Pipeline project that was completed in 2003. I worked on that one for several years. And um, that one shown right here in this area actually ended up being a twofer. By building that reservoir right there, it was very strategically located, and they were able to connect water all the way from that second aqueduct to Limonheim, but then they also built a tunnel over to Lake Hodges, and we're now able to uh, fill Lake Hodges from that second aqueduct as well, rather than rely entirely on rainwater. So they were able to get 24,000 acre feet out of the new dam and another 20,000 out of the other. And equally important was the strategic importance of that water being able to then connect it back to the second aqueduct. And the water in the Elevenhain Reservoir is primarily for emergency storage. They, they don't draw it down that much at any given time. They operate it with that emergency pending in mind. So it was, uh, that was part of the emergency storage project. And it, it was also centrally located in the, in the county, that allowing them to move water north or south in an emergency. That's what the dam looks like now, completed in 2003 or 4. Only 24,000 acre feet. It's not all that much water. Uh, as I mentioned, it's primarily for emergency carryover use. It, it turned out to be the largest roller compacted dam in the United States. And I'll talk a little bit more about roller compacted concrete. That's kind of the new thing, uh, the new old thing, I should say. Um, and like I said, they had a tunnel and pump station connector over to Lake Hodges, which uh, they've recently finished and picked up another 20,000 potential acre feet of storage over there. This is roller compacted concrete uh, back then at an eleven hand dam, and I, I got a little video that if it'll play, I'll show you a little better than this. But a lot of it's placed at night because temperature is the key factor with large, massive concrete structures. So if you look at Hoover Dam, think about how they built that in those monoliths, individual, and they had the cooling tubes running through the through the uh, concrete, trying to keep that temperature down. That that's the key because when the temperature heats up due to the hydration process of concrete. And when it eventually cools back down, it shrinks and cracks, and that's uh, that, that, uh, obviously not a good thing. Uh, so the key is to place it as cool as possible and or to cool it. Now with roller compacted concrete, it's placed in one foot thick lifts. It's a very, it's a leaner mix. There's not as much cement in it, so it doesn't gain as much heat. It's generally cool. They add ice to it. They place it at night. Do everything we can to keep the temperature cool, but you just keep going. You don't have to stop. You don't have to run cooling through it. So, in fact, the faster you go, the better, because you get better binding between these one-foot lifts as you build it up. And that was invented in the 1980s in, uh, in the United States. Uh, I believe the Army Corps of Engineers were the first one to give it a try. And learned quite a bit over the years about it, and ended up being a very big dam built by the Bureau in, uh, for Stillwater in Utah. And then it kind of died out a little bit with, uh, with the lack of large-scale dam building that was going on. But they still use roller compacted concrete on roads and airports and all different... Uh, 
paving type schemes. And, and as we start building more and rehabilitating more dams in the United States, it's, it's resurged back into the United States. Well, in the meantime, it developed overseas quite a bit. The rest of the world went on building a lot bigger and uh, uh, new dams all over the place. And RCC, a lot of the new innovations have developed overseas. So when we build Lebanon Dam, we learned quite a bit from international contractors and kind of developed, uh, really refined our techniques here. So it was a great opportunity. This ended up being the tallest one in the United States. The other project uh, from that emergency storage project was the San Vicente Dam race. And that one's just still actually technically under construction, although the concrete is all in place now. And that one is over in the east side of the county, and that was tied to the first aqueduct. But they had no <coughs> east-west corridor down there to get water over to the other aqueduct and feed the coastal areas. And so that became a key strategic uh, location to put in a large tunnel, actually, from uh, cross country, like an 11-mile tunnel. Very dramatic, very expensive and ambitious project right there. But they also decided to raise the dam and went for the largest race they could conceivably do on the site. So that's what it looked like before, built in 1942 during the war. And that's how much the reservoir expanded. But notice it went from 90,000 acre feet to 242,000. They picked up 150,000 more acre feet, which almost doubled their local supply there. Just a tremendous advantage to doing this. So that was an existing on-stream reservoir. And um, a, 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 a raise of a dam. They used roller compacted concrete on that, 117 foot raise. Only 600,000 cubic cars, not all that much. But it ended up being the largest dam raise in the United States and it turned out to be the largest roller compacted concrete dam raise in the world. Here's what it looked like before, and there's an artist's rendition of it afterwards. And I've got a little video here, I don't know if that'll play or not, but just very short, but it just shows the equipment moving a little bit. I don't suppose that's going to play. It doesn't really matter. The, the, I'll just describe what's going on. On the right, you see a bulldozer over there. And that load, that's concrete. It doesn't look like concrete. You wouldn't, want to, you wouldn't think you ever come out of the back of the truck for your driveway there. So it's dumped. It's more like a rocky soil, gravel type soil. And it's spread uh, in one foot thick lifts by the dozer. And then a roller compactor comes by and compacts it. And that's the process on and on and on and on. There's obviously forms on the upstream face. So this is where we actually are above the old dam. And the downstream usually has steps. You usually see steps on the downstream. It's actually work quite well for us building. So this is the primary means of building concrete dams now worldwide. And so should Auburn be back on the table as a concrete dam and you're going to move forward. I, I would, and this was proposed by Bechtel back in 19... When, were, when did they look at it for the state? I think it was 85, somewhere in there. They actually proposed, uh, I was reading a lot of history on the project. It predates a lot of my, my uh, engineering experience, so I, I had to go back and look over quite a bit of it. But uh, Bechtel actually did a study for the state and recommended RCC at a different location, actually, mile 19. Um, they had a couple different versions. So the, it, this, the current configuration you're looking at is not the only one that's ever been out there. It is the latest one with the cost estimate, but even that report will tell you there's a lot of other ways of doing this. So anyway, this would be the, very much on the minds of any consultant advising on how to build that building dam. That's pretty much it. I have a time lapse a photograph or a video if it'll play. I'll try to show it. It's kind of neat. It shows uh, that San Vicente Dam race in. Uh, there it is coming up in the of the old dam. If it was only that easy in real life, huh? Yeah. <laughs> we could go that fast. But the idea is to go fast with roller compacted concrete. You want to move fast. Those are the turnouts from the crane pads at the top. Spillways taking shape down the middle. Pretty much it. This project also had a couple interesting things. We actually had to uh, punch a new tunnel through the old dam with the reservoir in place. So that was uh, very interesting. Built a little 
cofferdam on the upstream of the face and punch through. There's also a lot of blasting at the toe of an existing dam, which is uh, always a challenge. So I wanted to make sure it didn't turn into a dam removal project. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, it was a success, and I think there's a good example of what a region can do pulling together. And it shows we are building dams, a little taste of the way that they're done now. I hope I talked a little bit about the overall process, and I'm available for any questions. When you did that roller dam process, was that a non-stop, I mean, 24-7 until it was done? A good question. Ideally, it is, and a good contractor will strive for that. And at Olivenheim, that was the case. Uh, at San Vicente, not so much. <laughs> it, it, that's the goal. It, it wasn't quite as, as uh, high a quality as we would have preferred in terms of continuous placement. So, but that's the goal. You want to keep moving as much as you can. They usually work two, two, two shifts a, a day. Uh, and, and they, they uh, do a little transition between shifts. Definitely place every night, but maybe not every day. Uh, but that's the goal. Because the longer that sits without putting another lift on, the more they have to do. If it sits for more than uh, roughly eight hours, they have to put a liquid grout down that will help bond the two lifts. And that works quite well up to a certain point. And then they have to uh, kind of brush the surface. And then if that if it sits even longer than that, they actually have to pressure high, high pressure wash it to expose some of the aggregates. So it's in the contractor's interest and everybody's interest to move as fast as you can. Good question. Well, that's an interesting one. Um, it was, uh, ideally, it was not what we wanted either. There it was another issue with the contract. We, Actually, uh, it's just that they upped the design cement to 150 pounds per cubic yard, which was a little more than we we felt needed, but we, th that we thought that would be able to re refine it and would motivate the contractor to do some testing. And then, but in addition to that, we use a large amount of fly ash, which is by itself cementitious, reacts with the cement, but not entirely. Actually used, I believe, 225 pounds of fly ash with the 150 pounds of cement. So it uh, we ideally would have brought it down to maybe 135. At Living Hain, it was uh, 132, 215, 132 pounds. So that's roughly a, a sack and a half. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's very, very lean. Any other questions? <laughs>